Let's begin with prayer. And I would like to ask you to keep in mind, particularly a classmate whose parents appear to be suffering from the coronavirus. They're quite ill. And for all those we know who are ill, especially those that we may know who are suffering from this virus, let's commend them to our Lord and ask for his healing and his presence. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I put a picture on this first slide that depicts the event that Edward Shree recounts at the very beginning of his chapter on confession, chapter 13. And it's a nice introduction to the topic for today, which is the Sacrament of Reconciliation, otherwise known as Confession. The painting there you see on the left is from Peter's perspective under the water as he's sinking into the Sea of Galilee and the Lord offering his hand through the water to pull him back out. Of course, the larger story is that the disciples were on a boat on the Sea of Galilee and they saw Jesus walking on the water. Peter had the faith to step out of his boat and was able to walk on the water as well until he began to doubt. He became afraid and began to sink. And this picture uh, is what it would have looked like from his point of view. And he cries out to the Lord before he sinks into the water, Lord, save me. And this is kind of a uh, motto or an overarching title for confession for Sri, that confession is where we call out to the Lord like Peter, save me. And the Lord does. The Lord reaches into the chaos of our sin, the things that are overwhelming us, and pulls us out. Okay, so we'll go through the Sacrament of Reconciliation today. Why is it necessary? What are its effects? What does it look like? Why do Catholics believe that one needs to confess one's sins to a priest? And the communal nature of reconciliation. So first, why is confession necessary in general? Why do we even need to take note of our sins and confess them to God? Well, in short, because we all are in need of God's forgiveness. Shri quotes this passage from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So all of us stand in need of reconciliation because all are subject to sin. We are all caught up in sin both in terms of the world we live in and our own lives as well. The world is structured in a way that it reflects sin. We are all implicated in it. We're all affected by it. And we all participate in it. We all contribute to the sin of the world. And so we stand in need of reconciliation because what this sin does is it separates us from God, it alienates us from God. I think I mentioned in a previous lecture the root for the word sin in English comes from the German Zunda, to tear apart or to rip apart, to tear asunder. So sin, what it does is it wounds us. It brings about an, inter, uh, con an inner conflict, a disintegration it alienates us from others, it divides us from ourselves and from God and from others and even from the natural world. It wounds us and it causes us then to wound others. So I chose this image from an Orthodox icon of the Good Samaritan parable. The Byzantine or Orthodox depictions of this parable are interesting because they portray the Good Samaritan as Christ himself. 
they see in this story of someone who helps a man who's beaten and wounded and in need of assistance, the healing presence of Christ himself. And he heals us because we cannot heal ourselves. We are helpless. We are like the man who's beaten and almost dead and who can't get up on his own, can't find his own remedies, can't find his own way to heal. And so we rely upon someone outside us to come and to heal us. And so it's God's mercy that we rely upon to heal us and to make us whole. And this raises a central point, key point, that it's only God who can forgive our sins. Because sin is primarily an, an offense against God. It is a subjective offense, like any offense in a relationship, but it's also an objective offense. It misaligns us with God. It puts our relationship with God out of joint, as it were. And just like a machine, if one of its key components is misaligned, it will cause further damage within the machine and maybe even further damage to things outside the machine. And in a similar way, spiritual disorder and dysfunction will manifest itself with further damage. So this misalignment, I think, is a good analogy because sin perpetuates itself and the damage uh, of sin leads to further damage. And so we cannot forgive ourselves. We need help. We need somebody else. The analogy of human interpersonal forgiveness applies here. If you offend someone else, you can't simply say, I'm sorry and I'm forgiven as well. In order to receive forgiveness, you need to go to the person you offended and receive it from them. It's really up to them whether to decide if you're forgiven or not. And so reconciliation, forgiveness is always an interpersonal reality. It always, it always involves at least two parties. And in terms of our spiritual life, it always has to involve God. God's the only one who can forgive our sins. The primary mode or vehicle of this forgiveness comes through Jesus's death on the cross, according to Christians. So it's Jesus's death on the cross that allows God's forgiveness to apply itself to the whole world. It's Jesus's death on the cross that brings our relationship to God back into alignment, personally, communally, and even cosmically. So the first step in Confessing sins is the recognition that one has sinned, but this awareness of sin is itself a grace. It's itself a gift that God gives us. One, for instance, if one has leprosy, it's very common that one doesn't even realize one is wounded because leprosy affects one's ability to feel and sense things, and this is the primary danger. To be aware of one's wound, to be aware of something that's wrong, is itself uh, the, a, a gift, a grace, and the first step toward healing. This faith that comes from being aware of one's own sin reveals our need then for mercy and healing. One sees one's sins through the gift of faith. It's really only faith that reveals that something is wrong. And then... Once one recognizes something is wrong, the next step is to reach out for forgiveness and for healing. I like the inclusion of this quote by Edward Shree from G.K. Chesterton that <clears throat> there are saints, there are people who are holy, whose lives are characterized more by grace and virtue than sin. But a saint only really means a man who really knows he is a sinner. You have this odd phenomenon in the Christian tradition that the ones who are held up as most holy are the ones who seem to be most sensitive to their own sins, most aware of their own sins. And that's because God's light, God's grace in one's life reveals everything about oneself, both one's beauty and one's goodness, one's gifts, one's aptitudes, 
but also one's defects, one's wounds, one's shortcomings, things that have to be improved. An analogy uh, that I borrow from Bishop Robert Barron here is that if you're driving a car, you see through the windshield. Your windshield is a kind of medium to your vision of the road. And oftentimes you're just seeing through it. You don't really notice the windshield itself. You don't notice any marks, any blemishes, any cracks that might be on the windshield, any bugs that might be blocking your vision. But when the light hits you straight on, especially at night, then you see all of those little flaws and defects, all those little blemishes in the windshield. And so the awareness of one's sins is kind of like that. The more light one receives from God, the more one can see one's own sins as well as one's own goodness and beauty. And in this way, the grace that leads us to repentance and then to reconciliation is leading us back to reality. Reconciliation is really about coming back in touch with who one is, what one's relationship with God is really like. It's an escape from the kind of self-deception, self-justification and rationalization that we're all prone to. And he writes at the end of the chapter that sadly many people go through their whole lives never coming to terms with their sins and weaknesses. They never take responsibility for their actions. They rationalize their selfish decisions and their neglect of family and friends. They always make excuses for their own shortcomings while blaming others for the problems in their lives. Such people are not living in reality. They keep up the illusion they have of themselves. They desperately cling to a thousand defense mechanisms and dysfunctions that help them avoid facing the truth about their lives. So we should never underestimate our capacity for self-deception. And reconciliation is really about seeing one's own spiritual life, one's own well-being from an external perspective so that one can have a more accurate and, and less self-deceived understanding of it. Okay, so there's two aspects, two, two main kind of effects that reconciliation has. <clears throat> the first we've already mentioned, <clears throat> namely that of revelation. Reconciliation is a kind of revelation. <clears throat> the Greek word um, apocalypse, apocalypses, uh, where we get the word apocalypse from, means revelation. And we experience reconciliation initially <clears throat> as a kind of apocalypse. It's the ending of something. It's the ending of a drama of sin and self-justification. When one finally sees, okay, I was wrong and I need to turn back, I need to change. This is in a sense a kind of cataclysm. It's, it's the ending of a, a way of doing things because one sees reality in a new way. So seeing one's sins is a kind of revelation, but it's a revelation that is transformative. So God's grace reveals the reality of our sins, shines a light on what's really there and therefore enables us to acknowledge this reality. And God then calls us to bring our sins into the light. <clears throat> and there's two dimensions of this that I wanted to point out. When you really uh, recognize something and then reveal it, bring it out into the light of day, we make our sins external to us in this way. And this is very therapeutic. If you're feeling even joy or happiness, if you're feeling sadness or dejection, it always helps to make those feelings external. Even if it's just writing them down in your journal or expressing them to yourself or expressing them in prayer, this is very helpful to make what's internal external in some way. So confessing these sins, especially verbally through prayer, through telling them to somebody else, brings these sins outside the realm of just your own mind and your own internal experience. And when you do that, you see how it weakens this sin in you. Sin is often uh, associated with shame, and shame often leads to concealment. Right? We try to hide our sins. <clears throat> 
But this is the way that sin thrives. It thrives in darkness. It thrives in concealment. And oftentimes when you make those sins external, they wither in the light. They're like gremlins, if you've ever seen that movie, that can't stand the light. To call them out for what they are, to reveal them to yourself, to God, to others, weakens their power. Our sins are usually more destructive than we think when we're living in them, when we're justifying them, when we're concealing them from ourselves and others. They're doing damage, and they're often doing more damage than we think. Our tendency is to downplay them. But when we reveal them, they usually appear much smaller than they really are. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of uh, sleeping and you hear a noise, whether it's the chewing of a mouse or the buzzing of a fly, and it takes on a disproportionate size in your mind, right? Because it's, it's disturbing you, it's bothering you. And then finally, when you reveal or capture this thing, it appears so small and insignificant. Well, sins are like that too. They seem to loom large in our mind, but when we make them external, we see the damage that they've done, but they also appear much smaller and, and weaker when they're brought into the light of day. Reconciliation is also a kind of liberation, and I associate it here with the biblical term exodus. So if apocalypse is a kind of revelation that is transformative and transforms one world into the other, liberation is a kind of movement from slavery to freedom. It is going out from a condition of servitude and confinement to a condition of freedom. Sin is characterized, particularly in the Old Testament, as a kind of weight. It's something that weighs you down. We carry it with us. And it hampers our movements. It hampers our growth. And we oftentimes don't even realize the effect that it's having, how much it's dragging us down, how much it is slowing us down. And so confession and penance frees us from this weight. Sometimes we don't even realize how much a sin is hampering us until we're freed from it. And we look back and we see uh, how hard we made our lives for ourselves when we were living in that sin. People who have recovered from addictions oftentimes express this. I never realized how stuck I was and how inhibited I was until I was freed. So confession and reconciliation lifts this weight from us and it frees us. But it frees us particularly to engage in and develop, resume sometimes, relationships. It makes us the type of person that can then enter into relationships that are life-giving. So it not only has an effect upon our own experience, but it also has these ripple effects outward from us through our relationships. It makes us capable of true and life-giving relationships. Okay, so the next question then that both Sri and Himes take on is, why does one need to confess to a priest? Why isn't it sufficient just to externalize your sins to yourself or to uh, another person? Well, the reason from the Catholic perspective begins with the fact that only God can forgive sins. So we cannot bestow forgiveness upon ourselves. And another human being cannot bestow forgiveness on us. It's true that we should ask God for forgiveness individually through personal prayer, but we also need something more than that. We need to be reintegrated into the community through the communal sacrament of confession. So the reason why there's this communal dimension is really because it's the way that Jesus has set things up for his community. In confession, one really does ask God for forgiveness, and one receives from God his own forgiveness. But it's through Christ that we receive this as Christians. So as God incarnate, Jesus Christ has the power to forgive sins, but he forgave sins in a particular way during his life on earth. He, he forgave them himself 
but he also bestowed the power to forgive sins to his apostles. He gave his apostles the power to bind and loose, which um, is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew. Whatever you bind here will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose here will be loose and loosened in heaven. This is an Old Testament image that refers to communal discipline. Who can participate in the synagogue? Who is a member of the community of Israel and who is not? To bind means to include, to integrate, and to loose means to cast out or to let go. And this power of binding and loosing was given to certain people within the Israelite community. And Jesus Christ similarly gives the power to forgive sins in the same way to his apostles, to the twelve that he chose to be his, the leaders of his community. Sri also mentions that this is a primary function of the Holy Spirit given to the apostles after Jesus' resurrection. In John 20, Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit upon the disciples. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then immediately after that, the very next sentence, whatever sins you forgive are forgiven, and whatever sins you do not forgive are not forgiven. And I love what Himes has to say about this in an earlier chapter where he's commenting on this same passage. He says that the first effect of the coming of the Spirit, according to John's Gospel, is that we can forgive one another, and that whatever has separated us from one another can now be healed. So it would be nice to be able to forgive ourselves or for another human being to forgive us at will. But it's not authentic. It's not real. Uh, only God can forgive us. Okay, the other part of Jesus' ministry that Sri mentions uh, is evidenced by St. Paul. So in St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he speaks of this ministry of reconciliation. St. Paul says that God has reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So it's not only that he gave us reconciliation, but he gave us a ministry of it. So even St. Paul's uh, work in the Christian community as a missionary involved some mediation of reconciliation and forgiveness through the leaders of the church community. So the bottom line is God entrusted the church with his own power to forgive sins. God, of course, can forgive sins, however, and to whomever he wills. But he's also left behind this, uh, this means, this medium of forgiveness through the sacrament of confession. And it's important to recognize, as Sri emphasizes, that it's really Jesus Christ who is affecting this forgiveness. He is the priest behind the priest. The priest is really just a vehicle. He's a conduit of the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers as God and man. He mentions that God's power to forgive is not limited to the sacrament. So this is not the only or the sole way that God forgives people. But the sacrament is nonetheless the ordinary and efficacious means of accessing the forgiveness offered by Christ. And this can be a great comfort for those who have a hard time believing that they could be forgiven. Or they have a hard time believing that simply praying to God is going to bring about this forgiveness that they long for. This sacrament, uh, Catholics believe, has the power to forgive sins through the very mode of its action. And in that way it's efficacious. It really does bring about forgiveness, independent of whether we happen to feel that forgiveness or not. Okay, the next thing to mention then is the communal dimension of reconciliation. And it's really Father Himes that brings this out most clearly. He comments at the beginning of the chapter that sin wounds not only the individual, but everybody that the individual is in relationship with. Sin not only wounds me, but all those that are related to me, all those upon whom I have some effect and impact. And he uses this assembly line analogy. So if you're a part of an assembly line, every person on the line has an essential role to play. 
and the final product depends upon everybody doing their job well and thoroughly. You're going to have a defective product at the end if somebody in the assembly line is compromised or is unable to do the job that they've been given. And so in this way, the sinfulness of every individual within the Christian community affects the overall capacity of that human community to image Christ in the world. Each of us, he writes, is called to a unique role in fulfilling the church's mission to make Christ fully present at all times in all places. And the reason for this is that we all stand in unique relationships to those in our lives. So only I am the particular son, parent, friend, in the particular context in which I relate to uh, people with whom I stand in those relationships. And so they depend upon me to bring Christ's presence into that relationship, into that context in which that relationship plays out. So sin diminishes not only my relationship with God, should be not only my relationship with God, this is the typo slide, I guess, but all my other relationships as well. It's not only just a vertical issue of my relationship with God, but it ripples out in all my relationships to other people, and other people are able or unable to see God in me and in the context in which we relate only if I am rightly related to God. Others depend upon me to embody Christ in those particular unique relationships I have with them. Okay, so going uh, further in this communal dimension of reconciliation, <clears throat> Our relationship to God depends upon our relationship to others. We can't be in right relationship with God without being in right relationship with others as well. And this comes from that second reason why Christians need the church. We can't rate, relate rightly to God unless we are in right relationship with other people. We can't love God without loving neighbor. And so therefore, we can't be reconciled to God without being reconciled to our neighbor. And just as we find God's love and the love that we share with others, we find God's forgiveness in the forgiveness we share with others. We enter into a kind of reconciling dynamic or current that not only involves your relationship with God, but draws other people into it as well. God's love isn't just something private that you enjoy with God, but you encounter it with others and you enter into it through others. You depend upon your relationship with others in a way in order to have right relationship with God. Well, similarly, if you're out of right relationship with God, then that return to right relationship also has to involve a return to right relationship with the community as well, with the other people around you. It's a kind of way of appreciating this. I thought it might be good to meditate on a minute uh, on what it's like to be in a communion line. What sort of impact does it have to show up to church, to go to confession, and to stand in line with the other people that you might know to receive this sacrament? Well, it emphasizes that you're all in the same boat. You're all in line together. You're all in need of forgiveness. It tells you something about everybody there. And when you're in that commun in that confession line, rather, when you're in that line to receive the sacrament of reconciliation, all of the differences that usually distinguish one person from another kind of disappear. There's a certain sense of equality there. And you're all seeking forgiveness together uh, at the same time. You're in the same place. You're receiving it from the same priest or the same set of priests. So there's a sense of solidarity as well. You're all taking action. You're all doing something common and concrete about this common need that you have. And it's incredibly leveling. You see other people as the same sort of vulnerable, weak, sinful creatures that you are. And it really, I think, uh, fosters trust in a community. You see your friends, your family, your fellow parishioners in the same struggles that you are in. And 
this applies even to the priest as well, and even to bishops and even to the Pope. See the picture there of Pope Francis receiving the sacrament. Uh, oftentimes, popes receive the sacrament of confession every day. Uh, it's not as if the holier you are, the less you need confession. It usually works the other way. Holier people go to this confession more often because they recognize their need, their weakness, their vulnerability. Okay, so back to Himes. God's forgiveness of us depends upon our forgiveness of others. So it goes beyond even just sort of a mutual implication that we have to make our relationship right with others in order to make our relationship right with God. It's a strict condition. Notice the line from the Our Father, which we said at the beginning of class. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's not just forgive us our trespasses and then we'll try to forgive those who trespass against us. That as there is really an entailment. It is basically saying forgive us our trespasses to the extent that we forgive those who trespass against us. It's a recognition that there is a kind of conditional relationship between our forgiveness of others and God's forgiveness of us. And to really drive home this point, Jesus told this parable in the Gospel of Matthew of the unmerciful servant. And to summarize it, there is a master who forgives his servant's debts, which are significant. And the servant is unable to pay these debts, and he finds himself facing imprisonment uh, and punishment. But the master is merciful and forgives his servant's debts and says, consider them canceled. The servant then, whose debts have just been forgiven, goes off and finds somebody who owes him money and then threatens the same punishment, but is not merciful. The servant refuses to forgive the debts of the person that owes him money. And so what happens? Well, the master finds out about this and then revokes his forgiveness of his servant's debts, saying basically, why should I forgive your debts? if you go off and treat others unmercifully. And Jesus concludes the parable by saying, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So it's a pretty strict commandment. God commands us to forgive. And it's not only one time, it's not a kind of limited commandment. His disciples even ask him, how many times should we forgive? our brother and sister, and he says, uh, it's not once, it's not even seven times, it's 70 times seven times, which is really an idiom for saying it's endlessly. Uh, this command has no limit. You're commanded and you're obligated to forgive your brother and your sister without limit. It raises the question, though, can we really make ourselves forgive from the heart? Is this something that we can just sort of will ourselves to do? Can we force ourselves to really forgive? Not just to say, I forgive you, but to actually mean it? Well, of course not. And this is why we need God's help. Even if we find ourselves in situations where we can't really authentically come to a state of forgiveness of another, we can still ask God's help realizing that this is what God expects from us, but we can't do it on our own. We need God's help to forgive even those around us. And this really drives home the point that to receive God's forgiveness, we have to enter into this broader current of forgiveness. God's forgiveness to the world is meant to apply to us, but also to flow forth from us. And if we re refuse to allow God's forgiveness to flow out of us towards others, then this compromises our access to God's forgiveness of us. So we sort of are entering into a current or a whole dynamic of forgiveness by receiving reconciliation. Himes concludes his chapter by noting that sins are not forgotten, but they are, however, redeemed. What does he mean by that? Well, the question basically is, does receiving reconciliation mean one's sins never happened? And does it remove their effects on our lives? Well, the answer here is no. So if one has an addiction to something, 
and one confesses that addiction as a sin in confession, that doesn't mean that one has any less tendency or any less disposition toward those same behaviors as before. But what it does mean is that there is a grace given to the person that latches on to this resolution to try to change, to try to be a different person. And even if one succeeds in overcoming one's sins, this does not entail a kind of amnesia, a denial that those sins ever happened, which would just be sort of a willful blindness. But it can allow those sins to take on a different character in our lives. It can allow us to remember them in a new way, in a different way. If those sins, if their primary meaning in our lives right now is that they're separating from us from God, they're destroying us, they're threatening us, then reconciliation can allow those sins to become scars that speak to a greater triumph. Now, the scars from the sins remain, but God's grace can transform them into something different. They can mean something different. So just like somebody could say, get a tattoo uh, that makes their scar from a surgery, something that's a mark of beauty. So the scars from our past sins can be uh, signs of God's power and God's victory in our life. Our sins can become a part of a greater story of redemption. They can really lead up to the bigger point, which is that we've been saved, we've been healed, we've been redeemed. And to that extent, they can really become sources of gratitude and love. Augustine remembers his sins with a kind of relish because without those sins, God would not have been able to come in and reveal his power in his life. And so those sins no longer are marks of shame but they are sources of gratitude because it's through those sins that Augustine was able to come to the truth and to receive God's grace. All right, just a very brief note on how to go to confession. I won't summarize all of this, but I thought I should at least mention how it actually works. And this will be up on the slides um, that I'll uh, put on our website. But it basically starts by reflecting on your sins and examining your own conscience, what's really bothering you. And then you go to confession, you go to a church, you go to a priest that's offering confession, and you begin in the way you begin every prayer as a Catholic, by invoking the Trinity. And then you give some sort of indication that you're here for confession. You say either, bless me, Father, for I have sinned, or you say, uh, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then you tell the priest how long it's been since your last confession. And then you commence to name the sins that are on your heart, the sins that you can remember, how many times you committed those sins. The priest may comment upon the sins that you've listed, may give you some advice, but then will ultimately assign you a penance, which is usually a set of prayers, maybe reading a psalm, maybe performing some act of, of prayer or devotion, and sometimes even an act of reconciliation or reparation. Say if you stole something, the priest might say, well, you have to give it back. And then the priest asks for an act of contrition, which you can see there on the bottom right. That's the standard formula for an act of contrition, but it doesn't need to always be that exact prayer. And then the priest extends his hands to you and prays the prayer of absolution over you, which is the conferral of the sacrament of, of reconciliation. Your sins are absolved. You're forgiven, and then you respond, Amen. And then there's a brief uh, concluding exchange. Thanks be to God, or thank you, Father. And um, that's how confession works. It's pretty simple. It's usually fairly brief, but it's extremely important. It's really pivotal in the spiritual life. Okay, <clears throat> and if you'll forgive me, I just want to conclude with this beautiful quotation from Pope Francis which expresses how the experience of forgiveness in the Sacrament of Reconciliation can really be an authentic encounter with Jesus himself. And for anybody who hasn't been for a long time or may be hesitant to go, uh, perhaps even for lack of faith, this can be a way of receiving faith. It can be a way of re-encountering God and it can be a, a new point of departure 
for one's spiritual life and for one's faith. Pope Francis writes, Everything in our life today, just as in Jesus' time, begins with an encounter, an encounter with this man, the carpenter of Nazareth, a man like all men and yet different. The first ones, John, Andrew, and Simon, felt themselves to be looked into their very depths, read in their most innermost being, and in them sprang forth a surprise, a wonder that instantly made them feel bound to him, made them feel different. We cannot understand this in dynamic of encounter which brings forth wonder and adherence if it has not been triggered by mercy. Only someone who has encountered mercy, who has been caressed by the tenderness of mercy, is happy and comfortable with the Lord. Forcing things a bit, I dare to say that the privileged locus of the encounter is the caress of the mercy of Jesus Christ on my sin. Pope Francis himself felt that he received his vocation to the priesthood uh, through an experience of confession where a priest was just waiting for him and he realized that the Lord was always waiting for him and was always making the first move to draw him to himself. Okay, so that's it for today and I look forward to perhaps seeing some of you in the live discussion meetings on Monday and uh, hope you're well and keep safe. Take care. God bless.